Go, brother Eric. <laughs> Happy Sabbath to you, Eric. Hey. We thank the Lord for the Sabbath and we welcome everyone to the midday presentation. And uh, everywhere we are tuned in, may the Lord bless us as we go through this uh, presentation. We are on number 13 in justification by faith. And uh, we are looking at uh, Christ in the law. And so I'd like us to welcome everyone. And uh, we are praying with you as you go through this presentation. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Brother Sam. Uh, before we begin, as is our custom, we will have to pray. We thank the Lord for the presentations, the first one, and uh, how it looked at uh, the first angel's message. And what we want to look at is also a continuation of that from a different perspective, uh, the details that we have been looking at uh, in Christ, our righteousness, justification by faith, and how we actually overcome uh, sin. So I'd like us, as I kneel and pray, we can bow and get a word of prayer before we proceed. We are praying. Our Heavenly Father, Jehovah God, we are before you once again. This Sabbath, we thank you for having taken care of us, Father, for the last six days and bringing us once again into this Sabbath. Because of your mercy, Father, you have enabled us, Father, to see this Sabbath once again. Even as you continue to sanctify us, we pray that you forgive us in areas in which we might have gone contrary to your will. May you continue to open our understanding, Father, and do so by your power of the Holy Spirit to transform them into experiences into our lives, that we might be able to shine with your glory, Father, in these last days. Be with us as we go through this session and for the remainder of the sessions. For this is our humble prayer, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen. Yeah, so we are continuing with our study on uh, justification by faith. And uh, last uh, study, we want to pick on from where we left, where today we want to look at, we read a quote which we want to begin with that said we have uh, preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that uh, had neither dew nor rain. So once we have gone through these uh, studies and we have come to understand from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, how we are justified by faith in the merits of Christ Jesus and, and, and how Christ made it that the keeping of the commandments is having the life of Christ in your soul, such that you will love God with your whole mind and strength and soul. And also this will be manifested in loving your fellow man. What then still is the purpose uh, of the law? So we read from that quote that we have to preach Christ in the law. And that is where we want to pick from because it's a very, in my experience while sharing, uh, you notice that there is this tendency of, for example, grace and law. When someone comes and speaks about the law, you will always find that there will be questions in the minds of uh, the listeners that then where, what is the part of grace? It is made in such a way that it looks like they are antagonistic to each other. And that is exactly what I see in our study for today. And uh, this statement that we are starting with, we will be able to finish with it. It shows us 
what inspiration uh, brought to our attention then that we must preach Christ in the law, then you will have a perfect balance. You are neither on either of the extremes of the pendulum, where it is cheap grace on this other side, and then this other side we have uh, actually legalism, where you look at the law and what you can, how you are outward obedience, as if that is what earns you uh, salvation. So some will start with this uh, statement from uh, 1888, uh, materials, page 560, paragraph 4, 1888 materials, page 560, paragraph 4, where it begins, you will meet with those who will say, You will meet with those who will say, yeah, actually it is the paragraph down there. Yes. You will meet with those who will say, you are too much excited. will say you are too much excited yes over this matter huh? then notice what he says you are too much in earnest so this this was people who are preaching uh, the righteousness of Christ and there are people who are telling them that you are too much excited over this matter. You are too much in earnest. You should not be reaching for the righteousness of Christ and making so much of that. You should preach the law. Then she stops quoting what apparently uh, some people who are to meet with those who are reaching for this righteousness of Christ will say to them. Then now she says, as a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. We must preach Christ in the law and there will be sap and nourishment in the preaching that will be as food to the famishing flock of God. So here, we see that as Seventh day Adventists, and this was this is 1888 materials, huh? we have been proud of our teaching of the law, it, especially the Sabbath commandment, which is largely neglected by the Christian world. But somehow, then it seems like they had not done it correctly. Otherwise, we will not find such statements that we, as a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. Then it comes out that we must preach so that there will be some food to the famishing flock of God. So according to the spirit of prophecy then, they had not been preaching the law correctly. And also we have not been preaching this correctly, because the end has not come. So we, we leave Christ out of the law. This is what actually she was saying. And this is what we continue to see sometimes, especially if you go to, I, I mean, I've seen this in our churches back in the, in the village. You will find that this is exactly what is going on. The way the law is being preached without Christ, that Christ is the one who will enable us to keep that law, it becomes nothing but uh, old, preaching old covenant law. Hmm? Yet that is still what is going on today in this council was given a long time. 
So, what is it about this law? Now, you know, it is something that the law is both is an integral part of, but there is a difference. Because text from the Bible that covenant of which the large part was the ten uh, commandment law. If you go to the book of uh, Hebrews eight seven to nine, Hebrews eight seven uh, to nine. The Apostle Paul writes this about the Old and the New Covenants. That for if that first covenant, that is the Old Covenant, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second, the New. Continuing. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So here we see that he found fault with the old covenant of which the Ten Commandments were the largest, the largest part. So does God change this law in the new covenant? Paul provides the answer in Hebrews 8.10. Hebrews 8.10. Where Paul says this favorite text that for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. So there is something different about this. Where is the law in the old covenant? In the Old Covenant, it is on stone. And that is the only place where it was. And where is the law in the New Covenant? It is in the heart, as we have read in Hebrews 8.10. So is there a difference between the heart and stone tablets? Our hearts, we are told, are not to be like stone. They are to be soft. So there is a difference in the place where you find the law. And if we preach the law on stone only, then that becomes old covenant preaching, which we were told that we have done much of. Preaching only the law in stone outside of the person helps no one. The law must be put in some other place. Hebrew says it must be put in the heart, in the inward parts of the individual. By the way, there is no problem in having the law in the stone tablets, because there is, there, is a, there, there is a symbolism to that also. It means it is unchangeable. It cannot be changed. It is on stone. It is the character of God, and God does not change. But here, we are making comparison between the stone and the heart in terms of the covenant, the old covenant and the new covenant, the promises in both of them. So we find that the new covenant promises something better than that. that was in the Old Testament, where the law is put in another place. So the difference between the law in stone and the law in heart is primarily a change in the location. In 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, there is a text that is also interesting about the law by Paul. There is a text in 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, which says that for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tablets of the heart. By the way, this is talking about the Ten Commandment law. For no other law was written upon tables of stone. 
It is only the Ten Commandments. And these we cannot be able to evade. That this text is speaking about the Ten Commandment uh, law. So under the New Covenant, God says that he's going to write the law on the fleshy tables of the heart. What is the difference? The law written on stone is critical and condemning. While that same law written in the heart is made more powerful and effective in the life of the recipient. One is transforming, one is unchanging, does not change. The law does not change when it is outside the person. But when it is taken inside, it is put in the heart, there is power that attends to it. So there is a vast difference between the two. It's like having medicine. You have it outside, or you can take it, ingest it, and then it will do its work in you. Therefore, we see that the new covenant provides something that the old covenant did not uh, provide. And we must be very cautious about preaching only the law on stone. We must be able to preach Christ in the law. We must be certain that we are preaching the law in the heart uh, also. So what was wrong or faulty about the old covenant? If you look at uh, Hebrews 8, 6, Paul talks about a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. If you look at the book, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 373, Ellen White has some very interesting insights on what exactly was the problem with the old covenant. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 373. She talks about this law, where it starts by saying, for what the law could not do. For what the law could not do, yes. In that it was weak through the flesh, it could not justify man. Huh? Because in his sinful nature, he could not keep the law continues, that God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So the law could not change me because in my sinful nature, it is impossible for me to keep it. The law, therefore, on stone can only have one purpose of condemning me. Because you remember the terms of the old covenant, as we read in the book Ezekiel 20.11 and Leviticus 18.5, were obey and live. It says, if a man do, he shall live and live in them. But cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. So the terms of the old covenant well, that you must obey the Ten Commandments law and live. Upon what conditions? Nine of them, five of them, it was obeying all of them. If you do not obey them, even one of them, you are supposed to die. And you are to keep all of them at the same time. So it is not enough to believe that the law is right. And uh, the same law in stone, you are to keep them all the time and never be able to transgress. So that is what we are attempting to do when we are preaching the law, Christ, I mean the law without Christ. We are supposed to preach Christ in the law because we are attempting to live in this new testament, in this new covenant time, we are attempting to live in the old covenant, uh, which is impossible for us. To do. Therefore, if we teach only the law in stone, we are condemning everybody to death. Remember Jeremiah 13, 25. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. It is an impossibility. Those who are attempting to keep the law in their own uh, strength, we, we must come to a position whereby we accept what the Bible says about man's being incapable of attaining the righteousness that is demanded by the law. And once you bring a people to arrive there, 
then they are ready to accept the righteousness of God. They are ready to allow God to do something for them which they cannot do for themselves. Now, this was the reason for the new covenant. So we need to come to a point where we understand that we are in the new covenant time, and that is what we are supposed to preach, Christ in the law and not preach uh, the law on stone because it is frustrating people. People like, like they are condemned. We have so many guilt feelings that never end because we are, try we are attempting to do an impossible uh, task. So this is uh, what I believe Sister White was uh, speaking to when she was saying that we had preached the law until we were as dry as the hills of Bilboa. We need to change our view on this and heed to the counsel that she gave. So the scriptures we have seen teach that the new covenant is based on better promises. And we are told Christ is the mediator of a better covenant that was established upon better promises. So what are these better promises? And it is here that we need to start getting the clear distinction between these two covenants, the old and the new covenant. Page 373, still on patriarchs and prophets. 373, patriarchs and prophets. Listen to what she has to say about the new covenant and what it was established upon. It says the, the new covenant was established upon better promises. Where it says the new covenant was established upon better promises, 372. The new covenant was established upon better promises, the promise of forgiveness of sins. Yes. The new covenant was established upon better promises. The promise of forgiveness of sins and of the grace of God to renew the heart and bring it into harmony with the principles of God's law. So here we are being told that there was forgiveness, in, there, there was no forgiveness, I mean, in the Old Testament at all. You had to perfectly obey all the time, which we have seen was impossible. And you are never forgiven in the Old Covenant once you break the law, even once. So we can see that one better promise the New Covenant is established on is the forgiveness of sins. And another better promise is the grace of God to renew the heart, because that is what we are told in Patriarchs 3.73. The promise of forgiveness of sins, one, and of the grace of God to renew the heart and bring it into harmony with the principles of God's law. Remember Jeremiah 31, 33, and 34, that this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah 31, 33, and 34, which we love to read. So God is going here to forgive our sins by his grace. And by his grace, again, he's going to renew our hearts in order to bring them into harmony with the principles of his law. This is different from just leaving the law on what? On stone. And notice, by the way, the language that is used here. Who is doing these things? It is not something that I do. I do not bring my life into harmony with the laws of God because I cannot. It is by his grace that my life is brought into harmony with his laws and not by a lifelong struggle. Remember what we are trying to get. It is not by his laws. He brings, he is the one that brings me into harmony. It is his activity, it is his work, and not my work. He is the one who performs the good work in us. He, he finishes the work that he, he started in us. It is his 
activity. And this is how it is accomplished. So for a long time, we had had this idea that sanctification is us struggling, trying in our lifetime to conform to the law of God. This is a different twist to that understanding. This is not sanctification at all. The real sanctification is that this is what God accomplishes as he renews our hearts by his divine grace. By his grace, he then brings us into harmony with these principles that he has implanted in our hearts. This is different from what we have uh, thought for a long time. In Hebrews 8, 10, notice again what the Bible has to say about where the law is to be put. Hebrews 8, 10. Paul is saying here that I will put My laws into their mind. I will put my law. Sorry for that uh, loss of connection there. So we were reading where we are seeing uh, in their hearts. And then Second Corinthians, where we have uh, also said, it says that these laws will be written with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. So here we are seeing that something is done by the divine power of the spirit on the heart. That is the mind. It is not what I do to change my mind, but what he does in me. Often we try to change our minds, which we are told we are also incapable of if we are reading these texts uh, correctly. God must be able to do this. He has promised that he is going to do it. He wants to do it and is able to do it. Thousands have testified, like we read in the Bible, that he has actually done it. And therefore we can be sure that he can do it uh, for you and for me also. So the preaching of the law alone is not going to make us righteous. It is just going to make us guilty and condemned to seek the divine help in order to overcome uh, temptation. We are not going to be in conformity with the law of God. And therefore, we need better promises than to obey and live, because none of us have obeyed. We try to obey, but that is not obedience. So we need better promises that come only when God writes the law in our hearts. And only God can be able to accomplish that, as we have read from those uh, texts. Now, the same is true of the righteousness of Christ. We can be able to preach a good message about the righteousness of Christ, but it will not accomplish anything unless Christ writes the law in the heart. We can talk about how we are justified by faith, but the issue here upon which the whole uh, problem revolves and concerns is whether the law has been written in my work is whether the law has been written in my heart. Have I experienced this transformation wrought by God in a supernatural way? There can be no righteousness in any of us without this divine transformation. So the law and 
justification by faith. Christ, our righteousness, correctly understood, are so intertwined and interrelated that we cannot be able to separate them. We should not be able to separate them. They are almost one and the same thing. Yes, technically, we can be able to differentiate and talk about them distinctly and separate as different messages and experiences. But what we are going to see is that they are so closely related that we are supposed to always keep them uh, together. We often attempt to preach justification by faith without the law. And we have also tried to preach Christ our righteousness. I mean, the law without Christ our righteousness. Therefore, we talk about writing the law in our hearts without even understanding what the law is or what Christ our righteousness is all about. And we need to understand that they go together. You want to see a quote from the same uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 372, that puts them together. And notice how Ellen White plays around with these uh, doctrines that we are talking about here. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 372, where we were. Patriarchs and Prophets, 372. where it says the same law that was engraved upon, the same law that was engraved upon. Yes. Now notice the use of the issues that we are discussing here. It says that the same law that was engraved upon the tables of stone, so we are talking about the law, is written by the Holy Spirit upon the table of the heart. Instead of going about to establish our own righteousness, we accept the righteousness of Christ. So notice she's talking about the righteousness of Christ in the same context as the law being written in our hearts. She continues that his blood atones for our sins. His obedience is accepted for us. Then the heart renewed by the Holy Spirit will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Through the grace of Christ, we shall live in obedience to the law of God, written where? Written upon our hearts. Having the Spirit of Christ, we shall walk even as he walked. So notice that here, She's talking about writing the law in our hearts and Christ our righteousness back and forth in the same paragraph. Why? Because she understood that it was the same thing. And it is a perversion of, our, of Christ our righteousness to teach it without teaching the law in our heart the same way as it is a perversion of the law to teach it on stone without teaching Christ our righteousness. So we leave out big portions of either if you preach one without uh, the other. And in 1888, from that quote, we were told we had succeeded in preaching the law until we were as dry as the hills of Gilboa. We need to be careful not to preach Christ, our righteousness, without the law, because this is not what we are seeing in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. They need to be put together. Let us go to Desire of Ages, page 762. Desire of Ages, 762. And notice what she says about writing in our hearts the law entails. Desire of Ages, 762, where it starts, the law requires righteousness. The law requires righteousness, yes. And what is this righteousness? A righteous life, a righteous character, and this man has not to give. He cannot meet the claims of God's holy law. But Christ, coming to the earth as man, lived a holy life and developed a perfect character. This he offers as a free gift to all who will receive them. His life stands for the life of men. 
Thus, they have remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. More than this, Christ imbues men with the, with the attributes of God. So this is what writing in our hearts where This is something that he takes from outside of us and puts inside of us. The quote continues before we leave it. Just down there, he builds up the human character. He builds up the human character, a goodly fabric of spiritual strength and beauty is fulfilled in the believer in Christ. That was just down there, some graph that you were reading. These are on pages 762. Yes, <laughs> the report finishes by saying he builds up the human character after the similitude of the divine character. A goodly fabric of the very righteousness of the law is fulfilled in the believer in what? In the believer in Christ. Remember the law, the quote starts by saying the law here that it is a righteous life, a perfect character. And we are told that to do this. And therefore, Christ came and did that for us outside of ourselves. And this he offers to us his blood. We have remission of our sins in the past through his blood. To imbue men with the attributes of God. And what are these attributes of God? What is the character of God? That it, what is the transcript of his character? Is the law that was written in stone. We keep saying that oh, the, the law is a transcript of God's character. This is what it means. Christ came and fulfilled that law. And this he offers to us for forgiveness of sin and more than that, for transformation of character. After the divine similitude, he imbues men with these attributes of God. He builds up the human character. I do not build it up. Notice the wording here also. The man does not do it on his own. It is God who does it in the man. He is the builder. We are the clay. And he is the potter. We are not the ground like we saw the other time. We are the ground, I mean. We are not the husband. He is the farmer. We are the ground. So in Christ, our righteousness, he comes and imbues me with the attributes of God. And this, if you notice, commingles back and forth. Writing the law in my heart is also Christ, my righteousness in, in me. They are all the same. So if we see it this way, it means we are going to present a balanced uh, message and we need to break it down so that people can be able to understand how they are the same. How can they be? And the question that we need to break down also is how do you write the law in somebody's heart? How do you get it inside a person? So this is what we want to see. If you read the book of uh, Matthew 22, 36 and 39 that we had read, uh, it's talking about uh, the person who came and asked Jesus, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And then Jesus answered, Thou shalt love the God, thy God, with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then Christ says, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thy, thyself. So Jesus teaches here that the law, what, what is the law? We can read the Ten Commandments, yes. But what exactly it is? What are the principles behind it? And the principles are broken down here into two. That the supreme law is supreme love for God and to love our neighbors as as ourselves. But notice here now in 1 John 4.16 where the Bible also teaches the attribute of God as being love. 
that God is God is love. So we put this together. Since the law is a transcript of God's character and God is love, it means that the law has to be the law of what? The law of love. So when God writes his law in our hearts, he writes love in our hearts. He does not put the law in stone in our hearts. It has to be this way. It has to be that God is love. The law is a transcript of his character. And therefore, when he wants to enable us to be righteous, to be in harmony with the principles of his law, he has to put his character of love in us. Then we can be able to fulfill the law. It cannot be that he puts it on a stone and then puts it physically in our hearts. Just like the Nicodemus, the how can a person be born again? It is not, it is not physically possible, yes. We're talking about spiritual things here. So our preaching has not always sometimes accurately represented, represented God. I remember, by the way, thinking about this law, the Ten Commandments, especially the second part that deals with the relationship between man and his fellow uh, beings also. And I remember, I don't know what question I was asked, but I said, by the way, if from the picture that we get of God in heaven, God and, his, and, and angels ministering to him, I mean, that second tablet of the stone does not actually apply to God. It applies, it is made for us, but it is the character of God. And that is why when you look at when Christ came and fulfilled this law, he it says he exemplified the law. He now made the law alive that we could be able to understand. Or when we are saying this is the character of God, if God were a man, this is how he will behave. He will love his neighbor as himself. But in heaven, now, like for example, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's uh, wife. I mean, God does not have a neighbor in heaven. I, I don't know. From what I've read in the Bible and the spiritual prophecy, this is the supreme ruler of the universe, the king of the universe. So this law was written for us, for created beings put upon this planet, that this is what it means to have the character of God. If you have the character of God, this is what you will be doing upon this earth. To your fellow human beings, this is what, how you will relate uh, with them. So we can make the law very uh, condemning and critical if we do not preach it correctly, if we do not preach Christ in, in the law, we should be able to ensure that every time we present the law as a transcript of his character and that his character is actually what? His character is love. Have I represented him well in my, my sharing? Have I only given the, condemn, the condemning part of the law and left out the other part? So we should always ensure that we rightly represent God, who is love, which was manifested by him sending his only begotten son to come and die uh, for us in order that we might be able to be saved. So God is love and the law is love because it is a transcript of his character. It is a list of things that show how love is for human beings, especially upon uh, this planet. So to get the law written in my heart, the love of God must be written there. Now it is impossible to get the law in stone, like we have said physically, inside somebody's heart. But you can get love in somebody's heart. And this is where I think we are supposed to be dwelling upon. Just like in the spirit of, I think, the conflict of ages series, we are told it begins that God is love, the first book, and the great controversy finishes. The last sentence is that God is what? God is love. In between is nothing but a manifestation of that love. So this is what we need to get to the people. 
that it is impossible to physically get this law in stone in the heart. But the heart of a human being was made to respond to love. People respond to love, whatever kind of love, parental love, to the extent that it is put in the law that thou shalt honor your mother and your, and your father, because God expects that. God expects that a child who has been brought up and was helpless, has been fed, has been taken care of, should be able not to behave like an animal to forget his aging parents, but to honor them even in their old age. So this is, these are things that are supposed to be made practical, that this is what it means. This is the end. By the way, we should be careful. This is the end of receiving this love in your heart. Sometimes we make it as if it is the beginning so that you can do it coldly like we want uh, to see. But I was saying that man was made to respond to love. Feel your love. The other our love is called what? All this love that we have in the world today, romantic love for fellow human being, marriage, whatever. And we saw the other time that love is an activity of the heart in which we are capable of responding to. So God knows that he can woo us through love that we can be able to submit to him. He wins us through his goodness. And when this love is in my heart, the love comes with his law because the law is love and God is what? And God is love. We have read this uh, quotation from Mount of Blessings, page 18. I think I'll just read it. We have read it in our studies where it says righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and God is love. It is conformity to the law of God for all thy commandments are righteousness. And love is the fulfilling of the law. So righteousness is love and love is the light and the life of God. Then it finishes by saying that we receive it says that the righteousness of God is embodied in who? In Christ. And we receive righteousness by receiving who? By receiving him. So whether it is the law written in my heart, whether it be his righteousness imputed and imparted to me, put into my life, or whether it be his love, you can see it is one and the same word. It is one and the same thing. For the law is love, God is life, is love, righteousness is obedience to the law. And obedience to the law is what? Is love. So the whole thing is what? Is love. And here, the Lord specifically taught that. Because when I receive him for righteousness, the law is in him. And love is in him. Because he loved us while we were yet sinners and died for us. So when I receive him, I receive righteousness. I receive the law that he kept. That is why he fulfilled the law. And fulfilling of the law is what? Is righteousness. And I receive the love of God for me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten what? Begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting, everlasting life. Therefore, the whole secret of getting the law in the heart is when I love God with all my heart. And when I'm brought to a position whereby I reach out and embrace Jesus and making the king and the Lord of my life. Until all my affections are removed from the world and focused on who? On Christ Jesus. Then his love is there. And then his law will also be what? Will also be there. So this is what we need to make clear. How to get the law into the heart is to get in, to fall in love with who? Is to fall in love with Jesus. So how do you fall in love with Jesus? We have read several texts we shall do, a recap. Because everything is wrapped up in that question. Because we can be able to teach doctrine. We can teach truth. We can teach salvation and Christ our righteousness and all these doctrines that are important and are present truth, repentance, confession, and conversion. But we have to come down to the most basic essential. How do you get people to love who? To love Jesus. The greatest thing in Christianity is to love God with all my heart, with all my heart. Then, a person shall be able to love his neighbors as he loves himself. So the writing of the law in the heart is encompassed 
and accomplished when God puts his love inside of a person. It is an activity of God. And we saw that the distinguishing feature of this God, that even though he is all powerful and can be able to do all things, after all, he created us, there is some, something that he cannot be able to. He does not force. There is no compulsion. Remember that quote that we read. And especially we say it for these last days where people have gotten into this group thing until they think that it is for, for the common good, we can force some people to do something, which is a dangerous thing because any time as a Christian, especially, you got yourself in a place where you think that you can help God by forcing people to be godly, you can be sure that you're worshiping the wrong God. But anyway, continuing with what you're saying, that this implanting of the love of God into the heart and the writing of the law is an activity of God. And in it, there is no force, there is no compulsion. There are pressures, yes. There are different ways God uses to woo the person. The love of God constrains us, says the Bible. It is a gentle drawing type of pressure, an alluring thing, not sticking, not weeping, not pushing or accusing. It is something that wins the heart and transforms the heart. It removes all the, 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 the enmity that was there. It leaves the soul naked for some time. The Bible says in 1 John 4.19 that we love him because he first loved us. So anytime we find there is a lack of love in our hearts for our fellow neighbors, for God, the solution is very clear. It is because you have not taken time to bask in the love of who? Because you have not taken time to bask in the love of God which will awaken love for him and for fellow human what? For fellow human beings. So what is the sequence? The sequence of falling in love with Jesus is described in the spirit of prophecy, like we have read. Desire of Ages, page 176. Very interesting. The insights that we have through this gift of the prophecy for the remnant people in the last days. Desire of Ages, page 176. The light shining from the cross, where it starts by saying, the light shining from the cross, yes, reveals the love of God. His love is drawing us to himself. If we do not resist this drawing, we shall be led to the foot of the cross in repentance for the sins that have crucified the Savior. The light shining from the cross reveals the love of God. His love is drawing us to himself. And if we do not resist this drawing, resist as in actively do something on our part to avoid being drawn by this love, we shall be led to the foot of the cross in repentance for the sins that have crucified the Savior. There is only one way we are reading here, that one can avoid coming to the cross. And that is to dig your heels in the earth and put a break and say, I'm not coming to the cross. I am not coming. And you will find, by the way, sometimes you have perfected this art where we have made religion so formal that it is not a matter of the heart that disarms us, makes us vulnerable. There are no tears that are shed in our churches nowadays. I've read in spiritual prophecy that conversion, that a fitful, where she talks about fitful and spasmodic religion and all these chaos that people have brought into the churches are not necessarily the sign of someone who has been broken in spirit and humbled. She says in another place that it can be seen in the silent cry in a corner somewhere and the coming out of tears from the earth. That person has been touched. He has let go of the bricks. He is being drawn to the foot of the cross. We have become so formal that we preach the law and Christ just like some theory that has got nothing to do with the uh, transformation of our lives and character. It is a humbling experience, yes. We have perfected the art, especially in this age of technology where people have phones. They claim that the song, the hymns are there and the word is being preached. And we put on the brakes by pretending that we are reading the Bible in the, in the phone, we are, we are looking for a hymn 
we are doing all these activities in the church and not paying attention so that our hearts may not be touched. So it is possible to be in the church for so many years, yet not be converted, not having gone through the experience of the new birth. But we are told that this battle is not with human beings. Paul was told when he was persecuting the servants of Jesus, the Lord met with him face to face and told him, it is And Paul asks, who are you? And Jesus tells him, I am the Lord Jesus. You are, you are fighting with me. So you can perfect the art of keeping our hearts become hard and hard. That small, the first, they were called to be soft. Put him in a position where it was difficult to be reached by the same leg until the volume loud, as we say, on that at that time. That manifestation of the spirit in drawing that you will need a more powerful one. You continue rejecting them. You end up in a position just like Pharaoh. Even until when your first body is killed, your heart, your mind will only be changed for a minute because you are suffering. And then after that, again, you change the reign of Jesus. We need to bring to preach this message in a way that is balanced, like we have been told. The law is there, but we need to preach Christ in the law, that people may be drawn to the cross that they may be humbled, but only for a time. Because after they have been at the foot of Jesus, they will not even want to live, just like Martha's sister, Mary. So we need to entice, we need to be on guard to ensure that this is the Lord who is enticing me. In this way, he is wooing that I may be able to be disarmed and receive his transforming power to overcome in that particular in which I am being wooed or drawn. So he draws us by the love of the cross. And if we do not resist, we will be led to the foot of the cross. Desire of Ages, page 176, uh, Sami. Desire of Ages, page 176. She continues to say where we were reading. down there, that then the Spirit of God, yeah, then the Spirit of God through faith produces a new life in the soul. What happens? The thoughts and desires are brought into obedience to the will of Christ. The heart, the mind are created anew in the image of him who works in us to subdue all things to himself. Then she finishes by saying, then the law of God is written in the mind and heart. And we can say with Christ, quoting Psalm 48, that I delight to do thy will, O oh my what? O oh my God. So it becomes a joyful and pleasant experience having the law in the heart if it is brought there the right way. It is exciting, good, and peaceful. You delight to do it when it is in your heart. But it is a different kind of delight, a different kind of joy than just having fun. It is not just having fun. The law in the heart does something wonderful for us in that it brings peace that surpasses all understanding, even in our tribulations in following our Lord Christ Jesus. And that peace is all that we need, especially in a chaotic world like that of today. We see this taught in that incident where Nicodemus, the scholar, and spiritual person asks Jesus, how can these things be? That is in John 3, 9. And we saw, and we are repeating, because in this incident of Nicodemus, there are so many lessons for us today. We saw that he was an educated man. We, he thought he understood everything. 
Yet he had to come to Jesus, by the way, secretly, because Jesus was making enemies with his group, with the leaders then. So he comes, yet he asks Jesus to explain how a person can be born again. And these are one of those uh, times where Jesus is asked an answer and he does not reply directly. If you look at this answer, you will not find like Jesus is answering this person directly because he, you expect an answer like, now, you know, this is how a person is born, is born again. Jesus is, is, is evading, is becoming a little evasive here if you do not read the text carefully. But Christ is making a point. Christ finally explains to him what he needed to hear about the new life. And he refers eventually to the experience of the brazen serpent where the children of Israel were beaten by poisonous serpents and were dying. A serpent is made of brass and put on a pole. And then all who looked at it will be able to live, yes. Takes him back to after kind of like evading the question. Uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent, very interesting the kind of answers that Christ usually gave because they, what they, they dealt with the issue that was spiritual. And sometimes if we do not put on those spiritual goggles, we do not see like he's answering the question directly. So how does that settle into your heart? He gives the story of, remember what Christ is dealing with. This is a leader in Israel, an educated person a teacher, but does not understand the, how to get to heaven, basically. How to be born again. And Christ answer his, answers him by giving uh, this incident of Moses being commanded by God to make a brazen serpent in the wilderness. And to tell the people that they must look in order to do what? To live. I'll not add anything. I want to read let us just go and look at the words of inspiration on this incident in the Desire of Ages, page 175. Very interesting uh, words that we find here. Desire of Ages, 175, where it starts by saying, whether for the healing of their wounds, whether for the healing of their wounds, whether for the healing of their wounds. Or pardon of their sins. Yes. So the following quotation, by the way, discusses the thinking of those people and of Nicodemus. And I think it applies to us especially as the Lord is drawing us to the cross and his love. So it says that whether for the healing of their wounds or the pardon of their sins, they could do nothing for themselves, but show their faith in the gift of God. They were to look and live. It continues in the next paragraph a bit there, that those who had been beaten by the serpents might have delayed to look they might have questioned how there could be efficacy in that brazen symbol. They might have demanded a scientific explanation. Explain to us, we, do not, we must understand it according to the principles that we learned in our schools. If not, we, are not, we can't. This thing does not make sense. So they might have demanded a scientific explanation. She says, but no explanation was given. They must accept the word of God to them through Moses. To refuse to look was to do what? Was to perish. Now what is the lesson that we learn from these words? Imagine yourself living in that time and the situation is so bad that people around you are being beaten by serpents. And you also have been beaten by a serpent. You have a short time to live. A doctor comes and says he has no medicine for you. Moses, meanwhile, is busy praying only for those people who had not been beaten. Then you hear the Lord 
telling Moses, make a brazen serpent, inanimate, and raise it up before the people. And the word goes out that everybody who looks will be able to do what? Will be able to live. Moses is a graduate. This was someone who had the worldly education in the palace of Pharaoh. And God takes him and takes away all those ideas that he has by putting him in the wilderness with, with the sheep for 40 years before he finally gives him this work. So this is a graduate, he's a doctor, he's a PhD holder probably. And he decides to forget all that he had been told because there is no science here. It is God saying, and the people do what? The people obey and they live. So he tells the people, people, God has said we do this, look and live and live. Now, how can you explain that in this world today to a science class? No one will be able to do what? To believe. So the same way, when the gospel of Christ is being preached, people ask, how can these things do what? How can these things be? That Christ died for me, especially for us who are in charge, that I can be accounted righteous on the account of somebody else. And the righteousness can also be put in me and I become transformed. So the Lord here, back to the story, is saying that just how his remedy worked is not important. That is not the issue, but only how you respond to what he says. Only that you do what is, do, what is what? What is required. If you do not look, you die. It requires faith. And some do not like faith, especially in these last days, where, like we said before, our education system, the world education system has prepared us to reject what is called faith. Unquestionable and questioning obedience to the word of God. We seek for explanations to everything. But the Bible says our only concern is to ensure that the command is coming from the right person, the right God that has loved us and sent Christ to die for us. We ensure that it is the right God, what he says we, we, we are to obey. Now that is faith. We are to walk by this faith and not by sight. So he says we are to look and leave. Some just go back to the quote we finish, 175. Well, in what he said, there are thousands today who need to learn the same truth that was taught to Nicodemus by the uplifted serpent. They depend on their obedience to the law of God to commend them to his faith. Wait a minute. This is what we have been studying throughout. So we need to learn the lesson. We are here with Nicodemus. We join the church. And then we forget that our works, our good works, and our not doing bad works once in a while is not what is going to commend us to the favor of God. There are thousands today, thousands of believers today, I might add, who need to learn the same truth that was taught to Nicodemus by the uplifted serpent. They depend on their obedience to the law of God to commend them to his favor. When they are bidden to look to Jesus and believe that he saves them solely through his grace, only through his grace, they exclaim, how can these things be when we are alive? All our lives we have been competing against each other. We have been taught, we have been taught to work hard so that we can go to national schools. We have, been, we have reached a situation whereby some students commit suicide because they achieved 98% score in some of the subjects. Because the parents have been pushing them to be perfect, they have to get 100% so that they can go to national schools, so that the parent can feel good, even when the child is not interested in those things, even when the child is breaking, even when the child is not using moral means to achieve what he is achieving. That is what we have gone through, all of us, in this system of education. And it has set us up 
to a situation whereby we doubt what the Bible says. We need to come to a point whereby we are with Nicodemus. So that after his conversation with Christ, like we read the other time, he went and searched the scriptures in a new world, in a new way. So they ask and exclaim, how can these things be? And I'm singing in the choir. How can it be when I am preaching in crusades? How can it be that that is not what commands me to God, but rather that I just look at Christ? How can that be? This is our problem today. We are so educated, so scientific, and so logical. We have figured out every little detail of our doctrine a thousand times to prove that we are right. But how can you prove what happened there in the wilderness? You have no proof. Those people who looked at the serpent were healed. Only by the testimonies can we prove. Because there were people who are lived. They say, how are you? You mean you looked at that serpent and lived? Yes, I'm here, I'm alive. How did it happen? That is none of our business. Those who look in faith unto Jesus become new creatures in Christ. And those who do not look end up dying. That is the lesson that we are to get here. We have the word of God and we have the testimony of those who experienced it. Leaves us very uncomfortable when you do not have proof. The quote continues to talk about what Nicodemus learned from this. It says, not through controversy, not through controversy and discussion, where it says, not through controversy. Yes, listen to these beautiful words. Not through controversy and discussion is the soul enlightened. We must look and live. Nicodemus received the lesson and carried it with him. His, his question was answered, not directly like when we are just casually reading the answers of Christ, but his question was answered and answered completely such that we are told he received the lesson and carried it with him. He searched the scriptures in a new way, not for the discussion of a theory, but in order to receive life for the soul. He began to see the kingdom of heaven as he submitted himself to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Notice, not for the discussion of a theory. Theory of evolution, theory of the world, all these things, theories that we learn in our education system, where we think that our work here on earth is just to defend our theories and look like we are very intelligent. When it comes to the issues of the heart, we are told here we must have faith. And we must learn to trust the leading of the Holy Spirit. We must learn to trust the Savior who died for us. We must learn to look and live. And this is why, by the way, the gospel is the great equalizer. There is neither young nor old. There is neither rich nor poor. All must look and do what? And live. So there are things, these are the side of heaven we will not be able to understand. But that is not the problem. What we need to be sure of, like we were told in the first lesson in the morning, we must, the first angel's message, we must be sure that we are following the right God. The instruction he gives once we have confirmed he is the right God, the loving God, then it means he loves me. And the instruction that he gives is for my benefit, then I will follow God. That is the work that we have been given to do. He has given us a thousand reasons to prove that he is good. We read in the scriptures how he empowered people, how he blessed people, how he gave them grace even in times of suffering, awaiting their resurrection and the crowns of glory. And therefore, that is the work that we have been given to do. So the matter of believing and looking and acting on the commands of Jesus is described in an experience of, as we close, experience of a man who had been crippled again for 38 years. And I want us to read these quotes from the book, Steps to Christ, page 50 and 51. This man who had been crippled for 38 years and who came every day to the pool of Bethesda, hoping to be healed. Notice what we are told in Steps to Christ, page 50. How this guy believed the impossible and he was healed. Beginning from where it says the poor sufferer. The poor sufferer was helpless. 
the poor sufferer was helpless. Yes. That is what Ellen White is saying. That the poor sufferer was helpless. He had not used his limbs for 38 years. Jesus bade him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. The sick man might have said, Lord, if thou wilt make me whole, I will obey thy word. I mean, I, I, mean, I can't, I have not walked for 38 years. So, Lord, just heal me, then I will be able to do what? To walk. But no, he believed Christ's word, believed that he was made whole, and he made the effort at once. Notice now what Ellen White says about this person, that he willed to walk, and he did walk. He acted on the word of Christ, and God gave the power. He was made what? He was made whole. So what is the sequence here? First is the command. Christ comes and makes a command. Then the person believes and acts on the belief and the command. But we usually say that we will act first, that we obey the law and then it commends us to who? To Christ. We need to change our minds in these last days. We need to give the proper everlasting gospel in these last days because that is the, the glory that is supposed to do it, to fill this earth. So you notice the sequence, the command, the belief, the acting on the belief and the command. So I will, we usually reverse it and say, I will do good. And then he will love me and accept me. Then I can follow Jesus. Jesus did not put it that way. He bids us to, fight, to first rise up and walk. We believe him because he is so good and he is so trustworthy. And then we act on the command. And that is the obedience of righteousness that comes in that form. Continuing in page 51 with that quote, uh, Sam. So we've seen the sequence. Command, believe. And even the last part was very interesting, that this person willed to walk and he did walk. So there is the aligning of the will to that of God. Who has given the command? In uh, 51, she continues to say, in like manner, yes. In like manner, you are a sinner, just like the helpless paralytic, because that is the uh, person she's comparing us to. You cannot atone for your past sins. You cannot change your heart and make yourself whole. But God promises to do all this for you through Christ. You believe that promise, rise up and walk. You confess your sins and give yourself to God, like the paralytic. You will, you will to serve him. You will to serve him. So your will must come into play. Just as surely as you do this, God will fulfill his word to you. If you believe the promise, believe that you are forgiven and cleansed, God supplies the fact you are made whole, just as Christ gave the paralytic power to walk when the man believed that he was healed. It is so if you believe it. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole, but say, I believe it. It is so, not because I feel it, but because God has done what, but because God has promised. So friends, it depends on the trust that we have put upon Jesus. How central we have made Christ in our lives and in our righteousness. Jesus has to become all the world to us. We are to look to him in faith and we will be able to live. Our problem is our unwillingness to look in faith and to realize that looking to Jesus is what is going to make us whole. Everything that we need has been accomplished for us in Jesus Christ. And by looking to him, the author and finisher of our faith, we are able to be transformed. He is righteous. He is love. He is law. Because today we are talking about Christ in the law. He is the exemplification of that. He is obedience. He obeyed that whole law until he told the people, who of you can condemn me of any sin? Who can accuse me of having broken any sin? Both the letter and the spirit of the law. He is our salvation. He died and took our place when we needed to die because the law said 
the soul that sinned, it shall surely do what? It shall surely die. So we put so many things on the way or in place of Christ Jesus, instead of allowing the beauty of Christ to attract us to the cross, where Christ says, by the way, in John 12, 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to who? Unto me. So we see here that the cross, if we remove all the things that obscure this light that is coming from the cross, has the power to draw all the people to Christ if they do not resist. If man does not resist, because man was given a heart that is capable of responding to love, then he will be disarmed and he will be drawn to the foot of the cross. It is a humbling experience, but it is miserable to be away from the cross. The humility only happens for a short time because you realize that all the people that are around you are also sinners in need of the same one, in need of the same grace. So he breaks your heart. You recognize that it is you who sent him to the what? To the cross. It is your sins that sent him to the cross. He came to die for you. And as you recognize this at the cross, an exchange takes place whereby his spirit, he writes the law in your what? In your heart. Because it is breaking of the law first that has brought you to the foot of the cross. That is what made Christ to die for you. So at that moment, he imputes his righteousness to you. And now an atonement has been done. At one moment, you are at one. The division, sin that caused the division between you and him is no longer there. Now you can no longer be separate. You walk together from hence forth in the Lord, working in you, ensuring that you live in accordance to the law of God. So you delight to do his will because the law is written in your heart, in your heart. It is a thrilling and joyful experience, and we are told that there is nothing like this. So this is what we are to preach. We are to remind ourselves. We are to present before the people that we might always preach Christ in the law, because Christ is still hung up there, drawing people to the cross. The cross still allures and appeals. He draws all who look to him when he's lifted up. So whenever we find emptiness in our hearts, the solution is not any other thing but to go to the foot of the cross and bask in the glory of his love. That how a sinner like me, by the way, we need to personalize that experience. It is objective, yes, but it is very subjective now when you apply, when you by faith look to the cross. When Moses built that serpent, it was for the people of Israel, all of them, it was a subjective, it was an objective thing in that it was for all. But those who died and those who did not die, it was because of their own decisions and response to the objective deed that had happened. So we personalize this experience at the cross. We take time and think the, about the issue that even if it were you alone in this world who had sinned, God would still have sent his son to come and die for you. And we take time at the foot of the cross and we are transformed because we realize how much God sacrificed and cry in sending his son Christ to die for you. It was all for me that he did that. And as your heart is filled with this love, you will respond by obedience to the law, not in your own strength, because at that moment, an exchange is taking place. You are changed, an experience is taking place in that the law is being written into your heart, into your heart. So we can pretend to be Christians for years, but I think this is the message for this time. We can pretend to be Christian, we can pretend to be ministers, we can pretend to be choir workers and all these things, but we are hiding, we are covering ourselves so that we are digging our feet in the ground so that we are not drawn to Christ, so that you can undergo this new birth experience. These exchanges to take place in us and the law has to be written in our hearts. So may the Lord continue to strengthen us in that, especially for us in these last days, the world wants to see Jesus. The world wants to see Jesus in you and in me. And all these impossible things of the work will be accomplished with the greatest miracle of all. The law is written in my heart and it is in your heart, is accomplished. 
then they will see that this is the character of God. This is the character of Jesus. Then the people will be transformed. Then the people will be drawn to the cross. Remember those people who came and told the disciples, we will see Jesus. People need to see Jesus. We need to preach the Christ in the law. We don't need to condemn people. We don't need to preach an unbalanced gospel where people think that it is in their own strength. Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. We need to open our hearts to him. May God bless us that we might open our hearts, that we might fulfill the text that we read as we were beginning, that I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And may God fill us with his love at all times, that we might be able to show the character of God to the world. May God bless us in Jesus' name. I'll kneel so that you can finish and get the comments and additions. We are praying. Heavenly Father, once again, we are before thee to thank you for the opportunity that you have given us once again to delve into your scripture, Father, and the great insights, Father, that you have given us as your remnant, Father, through the spirit of prophecy. Heavenly Father, how we pray that you may continue to open our hearts and our minds, Father, that even as we understand these things theoretically, Father, they might be manifested in our lives, that we might experience the new birth experience, Father, that we might experience the writing of the laws in our hearts because it is the reception of the righteousness of Christ, Father. It is justification by faith that will be manifested in obedience to all your commandments, that the world may behold you in us and that this work might be finished. May you be with us for this our humble prayer, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen. So we thank God, Sami, for the opportunity once again. Uh, we will go back to you so that you can take any comments and uh, additions. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Eric. And uh, we praise the Lord for all that uh, he's teaching us. And I believe that uh, people are digesting and uh, thinking about what is being presented and how it is practical to our lives. Any comments or any questions? I think, uh, Brother Mukaya, you have been answered with uh, Brother Zadok on what you should do about uh, uh, our messages being translated into other languages. I have a comment. Yes, Junius. Brother Junius, you are low. Yeah. Oh, I am low? Yes. Let's see. Okay. Uh, now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brother Eric was talking and explaining about the law of God. It was about 15 or 20 minutes in. And they were saying about the other section of the law being given to us. It is really about us. Uh, I, I, I understand it as when God was giving this to us, it was really a manifest manifestation of him, first of all, acting it out between him and his son. Because they had to have been two people to be able to express that love between two people so that it can be called love. So him giving his love to his son and his son giving back, now they acting it out through Christ and showing it to us as Christ living or God living through, through Christ to us to see him, we get to understand that love between man and man. And I appreciate even in the explanations given because we get to understand that really this love of God, you will have to love God first to be able to understand the value of love and it being expressed to somebody else. Because it is the love 
that creates that value of the person, of the human being next to you. So God loving us has already created the value of a human being, even being created in his image. So I get to see that is that expression of love from the father to his son. It created the value of the son that he lifted him up to be all, his name to be higher than even the angels or anything. So it is the same thing so that that it's being expressed to us when Christ comes and takes the same body as we do and we get called the sons of God. Because now God has created the value for the human being. That now as the angels witness this love, they get to understand that just as the way God has loved the human being, they have to do the same. So in their ministration, they get to understand the love of God even better. So it is now for us, as we look at that relationship of God, and Christ, we get to understand the value of a human being so that the fulfillment of, is it sec, first Corinthians, second Corinthians five from verse 17 onwards, making us ministers of reconciliation to God, we get to understand it better. And I appreciate, I appreciate all these teachings because they have made me learn of what or who God is through Christ because it has really made me grow and understand his love. So I get to understand why, even when I'm in this relationship with my wife, I get to love her because I love God. Even with my daughter that I have, when I love God, I will love my daughter. Not because she's my daughter, but she is a daughter of God. And I being a son of God, I will be able to act that love of God to be also a minister of reconciliation for her to God. I praise God for everything. And I thank you again. Be blessed. Amen. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, I'd like us uh, to break for lunch and then uh, we shall be coming back at uh, 3 p.m. for part 14 on justification the gospel of liberation in the book of Galatians part two. Otherwise, uh, I'd like us to contemplate upon uh, what we have heard because it is something to meditate ab about uh, the two sessions that have gone. It is so important to us to meditate about uh, what we have heard. Otherwise, have a good lunch and uh, let us meet at uh, 3 p.m. <laughs>